kind of fast, so uh, slow me down, that's fine. Um, I have a couple of objectives today. One of the biggest things that I want to do really is to kind of highlight the differences between adult and pediatrics. We know that about 20% of our volume that we see in the ER is pediatric, uh, which we don't see a lot, right? I mean, and the kids that are really sick, we even see less of those, which is good, uh, thankfully, because uh, kids don't get so sick that uh, we, we have to jump on them all the time. But uh, for sure, you have to be you know, knowing what you're going to do at the right time. And uh, I'm going to try to debunk some of the myths uh, of pre-hospital care. There's a lot of different things out there. You know, how do I take care of kids? What should I do? What shouldn't I do? And we'll try to talk about that. <coughs> And all that is going to be case format. These are going to be real life cases, and I'm going to highlight some of these things as we go along. I know a lot of you in the room, and I know you guys are awesome uh, at what you do, and, uh, and really I want to make you even awesomer. I don't know if that's even a word, awesome. But uh, uh, that's, that's my goal today, so uh, we'll go for that. The first thing, and we've all heard this, kids are not little adults, right? Their anatomy is different, development things are different, there's a lot of different things that uh, I'm going to highlight today that uh, is going to show you why kids are not little adults. And this is extremely important, whether it's from airway, whether it's from how you're handling the kid, the package of the kid, and then dealing, of course, um, with the, uh, the whole thing. And then the second thing that I want to highlight, and then this I'll go, go on to the lecture, is do not lie to kids, right? Once you lose the trust, once you start talking to them and you say the wrong thing, and then they realize that you're lying to them, then it's, you know, they're off to the races. They're never going to follow you. You're never going to be able to uh, calm them down um, and then, you know, transport them safely. Now, I can tell you, absolutely lie to the parents, okay? <laughs> Especially the dads, because by far, these guys, you know, the dad, I'm a dad, you know, so these are the ones that uh, are going to really give you the most trouble. Um, I remember a couple of years ago, I was uh, taking care of one of my buddies, is a, you know, ER doc, he's a military guy, a real tough guy, and he brought his son in, and uh, you know, he brought his son, he, this, the kid you know, basically just fell and broke his collarbone. Okay, this is serious, okay, a collarbone fracture, is serious. Uh, but the dad, you know, one of the best doctors I know, is like holding the kid, can't even talk to him, can't even talk, doesn't even want to talk to him, don't even talk, talk to mom, don't even, I said, well, you know, he broke his collarbone, don't even talk to me. Just do what you got to do. So, um, you know, again, it's, it's the parents are the ones that, you know, you really cater to. In the children's ER, this is all we do every day is, you know, and, you know, and try to calm the parents down. And that's okay. That's, that's the job. I get it. And that's all of your job out, um, you know, pre-hospital is to calm the parents down. Because they're scared. And, uh, and they should be. Because it's our kids. All right, so I'm going to go quickly through developmental, just so we're kind of all on the same stage. Because as I kind of do some of the cases, I want you to understand kind of you know kind of the age ranges and then how the kids are different as they progress. And most of us know this, especially if you have kids, right? So the infant, okay, so there's the neonatal pe um, period. That's the first uh, month of life, and then the infant kind of goes up through one year. And you can see basically these ones, they're the criers. Um, they you know always have the caregivers hold the patients. And, uh, but they will respond to physical stimuli. The toddlers then um, you know, start about age one to three, and these ones are starting mobile, mobile. they start walking. Um, they don't like being restrained, but they can be easily distracted. And distraction techniques are really important as you go along when you take care of kids. Um, and we, we have a child life specialist, I'll talk about later in like, the mini session, um, but a child life specialist whose whole job really is to kind of calm the kids down and distract them. The best distraction tool that you guys all have is your smartphone, by the way. So if you have a smartphone and you have something on there for the kids, that's one of the best things I've, I've used. Uh, we have iPads in the ER, but um, you know, the, uh, the, the phones are the best to kind of calm the kids down. Preschool age, uh, again, starting to get a little bit older before they get into school. These ones, they, they can actually follow directions, um, and uh, they like to be part of the team. You know, so you give them something to do, they like to be part of it. They are, of course, scared of pain, uh, but you should explain what you're doing. Okay, don't keep them in the dark. That's going to increase the anxiety uh, as you go along. School age, okay, these guys start to think like little adults, and you have to allow them to be, again, really part of the team. Allow them to make the decisions. Ask them, what you know, do you want this, do you want that? Um, and, and actually, you can engage them on taking the history. In fact, I've had kids that, you know, like for instance, uh, Spanish speaking parents, if I'm taking care of a parent, that, uh, you know, I ask the kids, you know, what's going on because they can communicate well. And you can trust them, they're, they're pretty good. And finally, the adolescents. These are the biggest pains, of course, but um, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. So, uh, you know, I don't have a teenager yet, but anyway, so. Um, but uh, they're, of course, concerned about their body image. They don't want to be embarrassed. You have to respect their privacy um, and un understand that uh, they know what's going on, so uh, to include them, for sure. So, 
Here we go. Hopefully someone's Facebooking me right now. I don't know. Maybe you're good at that, right? So you guys have heard this before probably about the pediatric assessment triangle. And I can't tell you enough of how important this is to really understand and utilize this a couple times during uh, a call. Because when you walk into a room, you should be able to tell right away if the kid's sick or not sick. Right away. I mean, it should be taking 13 seconds. Not only a second, three seconds, whatever. Um, and I try to teach this to the residents, the interns. Like, they, they have interns have no clue. You guys know the interns are, right? Like, you come in and they look at you and they're, like, scared. They're puking in the corner. And, they, you know, they're like, what the heck? Get out of the way. Where's the attending? And um, that's what I did. Get out of the way. Intern. Anyway, um, but it's really important for you to understand how to do, to do assessments right and to really get the general appearance within the first, you know, 10 seconds and, and, and tell if the kid's sick or not sick. And it's really three things. It's ABCs, right? It's the air, you know, their, their appearance, their airway, um, how they're doing with breathing, and then their circulation. Their appearance. So um, this is a mnemonic that I kind of like, um, you know, to really assess their appearance, the, the tickles mnemonic. So basically, how's their tone? Are they a floppy baby, right? I mean, that's obvious. If they're floppy, okay, they have no tone, no muscle strength, then you, um, you have to be concerned that it's serious. Um, if they're interactive, kids that are up talking and interactive talking to their parents are you know, almost always okay. Uh, but those ones that are laying there, not paying attention, staring off into space, staring off into space, absolutely should get you concerned. Consolability. If you can't console the child, this child's screaming, you're holding the child, the child's screaming, and you can't calm them down, that's absolutely a bad sign. Um, you know, how they look, okay, I think that's obvious. And then, uh, are, they, are they talking or not? So the tickles mnemonic is pretty good for that. Work of breathing, abnormal sounds. So you'll hear all kinds of different whistling and um, grunting and wheezing and all different kind of breath sounds. Um, we'll talk a little bit about it uh, a little bit. Abnormal position, um, you know, kind of like, are they holding themselves, kind of any deformities, these kind of things. Retractions, you know, are they using kind of their muscles in their neck or are they breathing from their belly? Do you see their um, ribs? Do you see their nose flaring? Okay, that's the flaring, their nostrils are flaring. And are they taking big gaps or, or not breathing at all? And then finally, circulation. Um, this is one that gets over missed, I think, the most, okay, on kids, because you think they look okay. And remember, kids decompensate quickly. They're fine, 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 and then they dump, okay? So you do have signs that I'm gonna talk about that can pick this up before they dump, okay? And, uh, and circulation um, is the biggest one, and so checking their capillary refill, okay? Cyanosis, I think, is easy, but you know, lifting up and checking under their skin. Are they modeled? Okay, do they have that marbling pattern? Are they modeled? Um, obviously, any obvious bleeding, you know, you're going to note and kind of take care of right away. So that's kind of like the pre-assessment triangle. Are there any questions about that? I think a lot of you probably heard that before. Um, I think I just wanted to kind of go over because it it's really important uh, to uh, to understand that. Good. Okay. So again, these are, uh, I'm going to go through about 10 cases, I think, that throughout the rest of the talk. And um, <coughs> these cases are real life. Um, so um, yeah, bear with me. <coughs> so this was a six month old, um, and uh, this is an uncommon um, six month old. You're called to the house um, because of respiratory distress, and uh, apparently, this is an infant that has a strider. Um, and everybody knows strider, it's that, you know, <coughs> breathing uh, and inspiration, that wheezing. If you will. And uh, apparently, mom reported that the child was recently discharged uh, from the hospital for a work of a platelet disorder. So, you know, whenever I hear uh, hematologic problems, any blood problems, then it always gets me nervous because, uh, you know, you think, you know, cancers, you're thinking all kinds of different things. And uh, when you hear platelets, you're thinking that they're going to be bleeding out or whatever. Um, but, um, but basically, I was fine and then started having strider, which is always when we see croup, right? We always see strider in the morning, uh, early, early morning, in the middle of the night. In fact, my son woke up at 4.30 and started barking. Um, so uh, it was perfect. I didn't slept yet. So um, anyway, the heart rate of this child, 140 over 160. EKG, uh, oh, EKG was done for the six months old. I thought that was awesome. Science tech. Um, respiratory rate was 30 to 50s. 90% um, of Romare. Blood pressure is 84 over 45. Um, and the, uh, the estimated weight was about uh, 10 kilos, which is pretty big for a six-month-old, but what can I say? Alan Tell. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I think the bottom line is, obviously you can see that there's some hypoxia going on that we have to be worried about. Um, and, uh, and the heart rate is actually okay, 140 to 160 uh, for a six-month-old. Um, but overall, the skin looks seems good, the blood pressure seems good, um, so let's kind of keep moving on. Um, so, 
In transport, the patient was kind of uh, held in the mom's arm, and I think that's really important. Again, you know, you have to make sure that the uh, patients are remaining calm, especially when they're in respiratory distress, because Strider, as we know, and I'll talk about it, um, you know, can get worse. Okay, so uh, especially if you calm, because you don't know if there's a foreign body there. Okay, you don't know what's causing the problems with the airway, um, and uh, if you upset the kids, you get them to move around, things can shift, and then their breathing can stop. Okay, so you have to keep them calm. Um, and then, uh, anyway, we gave you know, six liters uh, of ox or oxygen, I guess, a minute, and uh, of inhaled saline, and uh, just kind of humidified oxygen, basically. Um, and then uh, the mom didn't want an IV, you know, pre-hospital, which is always okay for these types of scenarios in my mind. Um, if, the kid, if you don't think the kid's in respiratory, you know, imminent respiratory failure, um, then, uh, you know, keeping them calm is okay at this point. So they got there and the patient did okay. We started some nebs um, and uh, for Strider we typically do racemic and a lot of pre-hospital you guys do racemic which I think is absolutely awesome for any kind of stridulous event um, and uh, because uh, even if it's like say a foreign body or whatever if there's a little bit of swelling racemic epi um, is definitely the way to go. Um, anyway this is an x-ray and this shows steeple sign. Um, this is kind of like the airway right here. This is the airway right here, it's where it's, uh, it looks like a church steeple. Okay, it's the trachea, and what that is is um, is swelling kind of the tracheal uh, bronchial tree there, um, and of course this is crew. Okay, so this is the very common thing that comes in um, uh, via EMS because the the parents are worried. Um, we know treatment at home, and what you can do as you guys you know on arrival, hopefully the parents have already done this, is take them into the warm mist of the shower. Um, you know, that's the first line. And if that doesn't work, you take them outside to the cold air. Um, and frequently, the, the kids that don't come in by ambulance, these kids are like fine, you know, when they get there because of the air. Um, um, and then, of course, by the time you guys bring them in, then they're definitely okay because they've been treated frequently. And even albuterol is typically okay uh, for these patients as well. So this is a quick thing about crew. I mean, it's not kind of like life-threatening, um, you know, generally. Uh, but again, you don't know it's crew uh, up front. But anyway, inflammation of the vocal cords. Viruses are almost always the cause, especially cause, especially parainfluenza. Um, but influenza can cause it. Um, RSV can cause it. Um, Ebola does not cause it, by the way. So, you know, a lot of But anyway, age three months to four years, usually the kids outgrow it. Kids can get croup actually older, okay, but uh, usually it's pretty self-limiting. They just have a bark and cough. It's not kind of as much stridor. Um, males are more common. We see in the winter months because of the viruses, and of course, it can last a couple days. And the treatment for um, all of us, really, humidified oxygen, receive a That's kind of the number one and two treatment. And then we almost always give steroids. We know that it only the swelling typically lasts like 48 hours, so I usually use Decadron, <coughs> which I think a lot of people even kind of um, can do pre-hospital. Um, um, but, uh, but steroids are definitely the way to go. And it helps. Okay. So there's three different breath sounds I wanted to kind of go over. So we just talked about strider. We know that's that, you know, wheezing, excuse me, that, 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 in, on inspiration you get that, you know, that barky, and then you, they have like a barky cough associated with it. So grunting is like, like a grunt. <laughs> You know, so they're grunting, and that's because they have a lot of pain on one side or the other from a pneumonia. Okay, this is the most, that's, that was a good grunt, right? Like, okay. um, and that's because of a pneumonia. So, um, so you, you will hear grunting. That is way worse than any of the other two. Okay, so if you hear grunting, if you hear a kid panting like a grunt, um, then that's, that's worse. Um, and then finally, wheezing. Okay, so we hear a lot of wheezing. Bring in a lot of asthma. Um, so you know what wheezing, you can hear it inspiration and expiration. What's worse? What wheezing's worse for if you hear wheezing? Okay, so if you have wheezing and there's a fever, okay, that's worse. Because that's frequently pneumonia or some other problem than just say asthma. <coughs> if you have wheezing just on one side, so that's focal wheezing, uh, these are all the F's, right? So fever and wheeze, focal wheeze, so one side more than the other. Um, and what I worry about that, usually like a foreign body. So they inhale a foreign body and you hear wheezing just on the right side, for instance. Or pneumonias can be focally, can just have wheezing on one side. So focal wheezing, fever with the wheeze, and then the other half is a first time wheezer. Okay, so kids that haven't wheezed before that now are wheezing, these are a little bit more concerning. You guys have heard about the enterovirus. Um, we've seen a lot of that over the last couple weeks, uh, or we don't know if it's the enterovirus 68 or just another enterovirus uh, uh, species, but um, rhinovirus, enterovirus, a lot of different things can cause this bronchiolitis and this wheezing in kids. Um, 
NEBS, I always recommend NEBS for any wheezing. Um, it may or may not help if it's like a you know, viral infection type thing, uh, like a bronchiolitis, but, um, but, it, but it's always worth a try for sure. So what else about respiratory distress? Because this is like very anxiety provoking for all of us. Um, you know, what else can we, uh, that I, I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page with. The number one thing with infants, okay, is that they breathe through their nose. Okay, they're not breathing through their mouth typically, okay? They will when their nose is clogged up, but in general, they're breathing through their nose, which is why you see that nasal flaring, these nostrils that go in and out to get more oxygen in. The number one treatment that we do in the ER and hopefully you know, pre-hospital is a suction. So if you can suction out their nose, and they can breathe, you almost always cure them. And you know, we have like a deep suction that goes way down, uh, and the parents are always like trying to steal that, like when they leave, and I'm like, you don't have a suction, like we have it hooked up to the wall. I don't, you know, they want like a long hose to go home, you know, like uh, yeah, all over the Valley. So um, anyway, absolutely suction up the noses. And then the other thing is these two numbers, okay? If a kid's breathing less than 12 times a minute or more than 60 times a minute, then these are your outliers, right? Anything more than that, that's dangerous. Anything less than that, that's not good either. In fact, less breathing is more scary to me than faster breathing. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. By the way, if you don't have a good triage nurse in your ER, then everybody breathes 12 times a minute. So that's just one of my best Actually, yeah. Any other myths? I mean, I, I hear this sometime that, um, you know, well, it looks okay. It's a little bit of an allergy. I'm coming in, you know, parents are like, oh, I can, you know, transport by car. It's okay. Um, or uh, they're having just a little bit of, uh, you know, wheezing. You know, we'll make it into the ER. Um, that's okay. But that is absolutely not okay because I kind of mentioned it before. Um, kids can look fine and then they just close off the airways and then you're like in trouble. Okay, so you have to jump on the kids. You have to treat them, you know, very aggressive. I'm very aggressive with the management of, you know, in the ER for, you know, especially with kids. And so you have to um, really kind of just jump on them, give them kind of a breathing treatment, you know, whatever it is, and get them, you know, going. A little oxygen. Blow by oxygen really does a lot, too. Epinephrine should be feared. Absolutely not. You know, kids can tolerate epi, no matter, you know, almost, unless you have a, a kid with a heart disease or heart defect, which is, like, extremely, like, rare, um, then uh, absolutely always consider giving epinephrine. Just give it, okay? If they're having trouble breathing um, and you're worried about them closing off. And I'm talking about an allergic reaction versus like maybe an asthma attack, or an asthma attack, but um, you know, to try it if you need to. And we come in and do it. Okay, this is just a quick anatomic look at children versus adults. Because if you have to intubate a kid, okay, you have to know what you're gonna be looking at and then know what some of the problems are um, when you go in. Okay, so you can see the uh, adults on the right and the child's up with uh, airways on the left. And I apologize if it's too small, but I'll just highlight it quickly. Basically, we know the tongue is bigger, okay, and the mouth is compared to adult. So when you look in, there's a big tongue there, uh, especially if you're dealing with some of the special needs kids, like, uh, uh, you know, Down syndrome, for instance, okay, so they can have uh, a large tongue. Um, you know, their pharynx is smaller, so their back of their airway is smaller, so you really have to get a good visual visualization. Their epiglottis is floppy. In fact, you look in a lot of kids now, I know a lot of you have probably done this, you look in and you can see the epiglottis in the back of their throat. I mean, sometimes they can really open uh, wide. Uh, it's really big and it's, and it's pretty floppy. It's very anterior, so when you go in for an airway, just expect it to be way up front as compared to an, an adult, okay? So you really have to, you know, pick the right blade, always pretty much, pretty much use a straight blade, especially for the younger kids. Uh, because you really just have to kind of lift up everything. You can't assume that you're going to be able to get into the lechiel with a curved blade and then pull up and the other glottis will come up with it. You kind of have to just pull up everything uh, with a straight blade. Um, and then, of course, um, the trachea is, it, trachea is smaller, so you, you definitely have to know what size you teach it to, you know, once you enter the kid. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to do that. I'm a big fan of bras, though. I'll show you a picture of it later. Um, and uh, just, you know, make sure you have all the right equipment. And then deeper, um, we know that um, you know the airways are smaller. Makes sense. Um, everything can collapse, and then they're diaphragm dependent, which means that eventually they'll tuck out. They can absolutely they can breathe 60 times a minute for two to three days, way better than all of us can here in this room. Um, and uh, but you know eventually their intercostal muscles will give out, um, and, uh, and their accessory muscles. And a lot of times they don't come in right away, right? They, they're two or three days into their illness before we all see them. Okay, moving on a little bit, I do want to highlight about, um, uh, you know, the pediatric vital signs. There's no doubt that um, as you get older with kids, 
everything changes, right? The vitals change. You can see a heart rate in a newborn could be normal, could be up to 180 beats a minute, right? We're like, oh my God, 180 beats a minute. But, um, but absolutely, the first couple of weeks of life, they can actually be fast. And they can breathe 50 times a minute, okay? Um, and this is all normal. Um, so you have to know, and, and it, it changes every couple months, and so you have to kind of know your vitals. Well, no one's going to memorize these you know, categories. I can make generalities like less than 12 is bad, greater than 60 is bad, um, you know, heart rate greater than 200 is bad. Uh, that makes sense, right? Uh, heart rate less than 60 is not that good on the young, under one year. Um, but in general, if the better you know the vitals, you know, the better off that we'll all be. Um, and so I recommend you know, you know, using your iPhone, using some kind of um, thing to kind of remember because I had to post it in the ER because I, I continue to look at it. You know, before I discharge any kid, um, you know, I make sure. Where did this come into play? Well, sometimes a kid can look pretty good, and if you look at their vitals closely, it can give you a clue at how sick they are. Makes sense, right? Um, so we had a kid recently, a 12-year-old, looked pretty good. Okay, thought they had a little sore throat, had a fever. Um, they treated with Tylenol, Motrin. Kid got better, was drinking fluids. What they didn't notice was the kid's heart rate, 12 year old was like 150 when they discharged the kid. That's it. That's the only thing that was abnormal was our heart. Like when I looked at the chart, right? Uh, looking back, retrospective bias when something you know, goes wrong. Um, the heart rate was 150. Uh, that was the only thing. The kid came back in about 36 hours, basically in septic shock, okay? He had uh, group, uh, group A strep bacteremia, okay? So he didn't even have strep throat, like the strep was negative in the ear. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you think about, like, and, and unfortunately, the, the kid lived. Fortunately, the kid lived. Uh, unfortunately, because of the septic shock, uh, lost some, uh, some limbs and, and things like that from the pressures that he needed. Um, and I'm not saying he did anything wrong necessarily because, I mean, it, with group A stroke bacteremia is people, most, most kids die from it. Um, but, um, um, but if you kind of look back and you think, man, if I would have just picked up that heart rate of 150, you know, so always, you know, understand the vitals is, is extremely important. And I'm a big fan of smartphone or smartphones in general. I used to say iPhones, but then a lot of people don't have iPhones, so I got yelled at. So anyway, I have a six plus, by the way, and it's like way too big. And uh, my wife's like, finally, there's something big in your pocket, and I was like, that's not a very funny joke. But <laughs> <laughs> no one laughed right away. I was getting nervous at that. You know, it was like a, it was a joke. Too. All right, let's keep going. All right, uh, any questions about that case? Let's move on to another respiratory distress. Now you come in and you see a kid who's sitting forward and drooling, okay? And not really talking to you, and not really breathing all that well. Um, and um, this kid also has an inspiratory strider, and you're like, oh my God, what's going on? This child looks very sick and is tired and is sitting like this. Guesses on what it could be, you could yell it out. What's that? Epiglottitis, great. So this is tripod position, right? We know it when they're leaning on like kind of their, um, their elbows on their knees, sitting forward because that's the way they're opening up their, um, their mouth. By the way, when you intubate a kid, you know, we don't want to crank up on the head. We, we all know you bring the, the head forward um, and that opens up their airways. Again, being more anterior. So this is how he's able to get breaths in. And in the ER, the x-ray basically shows the epiglottis, okay? We know when we intubate, you know, the follicular, like in adults, we, you put the blade in here and you lift up and the epiglottis goes up. Yeah, sorry for everybody who's looking at this one. The epiglottis right here, this is the follicular, again, where you would maybe intubate or with, the, with, the, um, with the blade pull up, and the epiglottis comes up. So this right here is fat, basically. Typically, this is called thumb sign. Typically, if you look at an x-ray and you hold your thumb, Okay, it should look like, like the epiglottis looks like that. Okay, when you have, that's a normal epiglottis. When you have epiglottitis, it becomes inflamed and you can turn your thumb and you have a thumbprint, right? You turn it and it becomes flat, fat. Um, that's epiglottitis. Um, and uh, so this isn't good. We don't see this as much in younger kids because of vaccines and things, um, thankfully. We now kind of see more adults, actually. Um, but, uh, but this can really happen and, uh, and always something to think about. What you don't necessarily want to do is try to intubate a kid like this um, because you can lose the airway. You go in there and uh, um, it, the epiglottis is so fat that you may not be able to kind of intubate it. So if you have to get like paralytic or something, um, you just have to be very careful. So we don't typically paralyze the kids. Uh, we have to intubate them for that. So we're seeing it more in the older kids, um, you know, typically over five. So you know, if they're having strider, again, more like you know, if they're using a croup, now they have strider in an older kid. Okay, could it be epiglottitis? 
Um, H flu uh, was one of the most common uh, organisms that we see with that. Again, with vaccines, that's kind of gotten a lot better. Um, that's usually high uh, onset of um, fever and then stridor and drooling. Um, you don't necessarily want to give racemic epi, although I still think that there's probably some room for it. Uh, Albuterol is probably okay, but just try to keep them calm and just high flow. Um, and again, don't really manipulate the airway. And that's basically for, um, for hepatitis. Other things for when you walk in and you do the first A, the airway and appearance of a kid, some of the things that make, should make you more nervous if this kid's probably a little sick. Um, or how can you anticipate that they're going to have respiratory failure and you're going to move to a bed, you know, to start uh, giving them supplemental oxygen? Uh, what are those signs when you're going to start giving them? Use the BBM. Okay, so if you see that they have, if you come in and they're breathing more than 60 times a minute, okay, and they have nasal flaring, um, retractions, sea salt breathing, um, or grunting, then I, you know, really get concerned that there's something bad that's going to happen. Um, again, I mentioned some kind of like the respiratory rate, if it's less than 12, if it's greater than 60, um, but that's some developmental. So infants should be breathing 20 times a minute, children 16, um, adolescents 12, um, should be more than that. So if it, it starts getting lower. And then bradycardia. Okay, so we think like, oh, you have an athletic heart rate, um, but for younger kids, any heart rate below 60 is not good. Okay, so um, in, the, in the setting of respiratory problems and low heart rate, that's bad, and I'll show a case here in a minute. <coughs> Again, absolutely, these, these, these are the types of kids that um, you're about ready to intubate, right? You don't hear anything at all, or they're not breathing. Um, it's paradoxical, meaning like they look like they should be breathing 60 times a minute, but they're breathing like six times a minute, 10 times a minute. Um, and then cyanosis. So if they're blue, you're giving them 100% oxygen. If they're still blue, you're like, what else do I do? Um, you know, it's. Uh, it's pretty obvious. Obviously, you're going to intubate somebody with cardiac arrest or give them oxygen and then alter their status. This is just a quick uh, uh, illustration of single uh, provider BBM. Most of you, everybody knows this. Um, this is really, I, I show this picture to the interns because, um, again, you know, they just kind of slammed the BBM and the kids like a pushback and then like through the, uh, the stretcher. And uh, so it's really just bring up the, uh, the bag belt mask up into your hand, bring the mask up into uh, your hand and uh, and it'll help deliver that to their seniors. And this case, <coughs> the reason I showed this x-ray is everybody's like, oh wow, that, I mean, I can't believe, and maybe we should intubate more kids in the field. Maybe we should intubate more kids in the ER. Um, and this is kind of one of the pictures I showed that this is why we don't want to ever intubate anybody ever, any kid ever. Okay, so. This case was a 16-month-old who came in with a seizure, and um, it was a, basically was a, a febrile, febrile seizure, but then it kind of went into status after that. Um, didn't stop seizing. Finally, we got to stop seizing. And you feel good. We got to stop seizing. And then, of course, because you gave so many medication, and they're sick, and they seized for like the last year, 45 minutes, now they're not breathing at all. So we went to intubate the kid. And two things happen when you intubate a kid on a younger kid. Um, one that you have to be worried about. One is when you intubate a kid, a lot, and you give a paralytic, and we give a when you, when, but anytime you intubate a kid, a lot of times their blood pressure drops, okay? Um, because of the intrathoracic intra pressure changes and the blood pressure drops. So the blood pressure drops, and if you're not right on top of their volume, like if they're dehydrated already to begin with, um, then you're not going to get their blood pressure back and they'll go to cardiac arrest. Okay, so what I do frequently on a sick kid when I have to intubate, you know, we'll have boluses of fluid, and I'm talking about like 20 cc syringes or whatever, um, or give the fluid before you attempt to, you know, intubate. Um, and we, and I just push, I just have somebody pushing, you know, volumes in to keep the pressure up. Okay, because you don't want to, you know, you have an empty tank, you intubate, the thoracic pressure, you know, drops, and then, you know, you're never going to get the pulse back. But the other thing is a right main stem intubation, and that's what happened here. Okay, and that's what happened in this case. So we get it in, you're high-fiving everybody because you got a good airway established, and the vitals look good, and you kind of like, you know, time to go to the ICU. And then the kid decompensates, and then goes into cardiac arrest, and you're like, what happened? Um, we know the mnemonic is dope, right? Mm -hmm. So after you intubate anybody, you think things are good, and then, you know, something happens to um, the kid or the adult, um, it's the dope. So the air, like, Dope is displacement, right? So dislodgement of the ET tube. O is obstruction, so there's like a mucus plug. We've seen that happen a lot. Um, P is a pneumothorax, 
okay? And then E is equipment failure. Um, this here, what happened here was the ET2 went into the right main stem, okay? So then the left lung um, collapses, okay? It goes out, it just, you're not using it. And for a kid who's sick, um, usually they can tolerate it pretty well, or to, a normal kid, you can tolerate it just having one lung okay. Um, but for a kid who's already sick, um, then they can decompensate and then progress to death. Um, so you have to be careful. So this, so bottom line is when you intubate, make sure you don't go in, you go in the right amount, right? Make sure you're not in the right main stem. And you have to, con and people who do transport like from one facility to another know, you have to constantly be checking it. You check it when you get there, you check it in the room, you check it when you get there. You know, so um, multiple checks, um, especially when you use an uncuffed tube, especially when you're talking about a kid with their, their airway maybe only like this, and they move their neck a little bit and it can come out, it can go deeper. Um, so it's really tricky, it's really tricky. You have to have somebody just on that airway, uh, which makes it really hard pre-hospital, it makes it hard in the ER. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just really tricky. All right, so that's kind of a little bit about respiratory. Let's move on a little bit more to something else. Infants, we know, have those big wobbly heads. You know, they're like real cute, like big heads, little bodies. Um, and this just graph illustrates kind of their body proportion to like an adult. So you can see how big their head is as compared to like their counterparts of an adult. Um, and, and even their abdomen, uh, you know, kind of uh, a little bit wider. Um, their organs are kind of more exposed. Um, but in general, um, for trauma, okay, we'll move to trauma now, I guess. Um, hopefully we'll see what the next slide is. Um, the, uh, the heads are big, so when they fall, they're going to you know, smack their head. No, oh, geez, we're still doing that right. Sorry, these are things I kind of talked about. The two other things, um, you know, basically, just we, we talked about a little bit before, bringing their head up. Okay, so if you can put, like, some padding up underneath their shoulders, um, then just avoid, you know, hyperextension or hyperflexion. I think that last slide was in one place. Okay. Um, I wanted to show a couple rashes throughout the lecture because I think that, um, you know, when it may or may not be common, you know, trying to this is a patient who's sick, um, you know, it's just good teaching for pediatrics. We see tons of rashes, you know. And by the way, there's a secret. Like, if you go to a dermatologist with a rash, only like 50% of the time do they know what the rash is, okay? And, uh, you know, they give, if it's wet, they give some drying formula, and if it's dry, they give some moisture formula. So, um, you should go into dermatology because they work like three days a week and, you know, make like twice as much money. Okay. Um, anybody know what this rash is without even knowing any history? I think I heard somebody say it. It's purpura, it's a, but is it purpura, um, which is kind of like this uh, vascular, these red purple vascular markings. And uh, if this, if you heard the history or story of the uh, kid having um, fever, you think nice, Neisseria meningitis, okay, meningococcemia. Um, so meningitis from Neisseria um, species, um, and uh, and this is a deadly kind of meningitis. So if you see this, then um, try to stay away. I guess. All right, let's move over to another case. Uh, Six-year-old, um, parents called uh, 911 for lethargy, and you find a kid real floppy and pale. I mentioned that floppy babies are scary babies. Okay, you want ones with good muscular tone sitting up and talking to you. Um, but anyway, uh, this kid had a history of fever, nausea, and vomiting. Um, Pre-hospital, you aren't able to really get a good blood pressure, can't really get a good heart rate, and you're like, what the heck's going on with my equipment? Um, they're trying to listen, can't really tell. Respirators are 20, felt warm, and then 88% of them are And this is when you get on telemetry. Um, basically, a slow heart rate, right? Pretty bradycardic. Now, a couple different uh, bradycardia. We see sinus brady, right? Um, this is just a quick rhythm review, I guess. Um, rhythm strip review. Sinus brady, P wave, QRST, but just a real slow heart rate. Um, and then this one, what do you guys say? Probably about. It's pretty slow. That's, that's real slow. Anyway, um, a junctional Brady. Um, so clearly there's no P waves, but then uh, the, the, the ventricle takes over and usually tries to beat about 40 times a minute. Um, and then the idioventricular, um, no P wave, but then uh, uh, YQRS. And that's usually some problem with their uh, con conduction system. So what causes low heart rates in kids, right? Um, you know, most often it's not a heart problem. Okay, but it's a non-heart problem. Okay, usually it's low oxygen frequently, 
low oxygen will cause the brain cardiac hits. Um, and then other things, um, especially, you know, so 36% of the time, time, there's some issue with their um, oxygen level. Sometimes they're shot, sometimes it's trauma, sometimes it's tox, you know, if there's like some overdoses, things like that. And we kind of know how to kind of support the, uh, these types of patients. And we know the drugs, right? Atropine, you can try epinephrine, glucagon, uh, dopamine, and then even pacing. The other thing is low blood sugar is, has to be on your differential um, for bradycardia as well. Um, and so I'm a big fan of almost every kid you pick up, especially if there's some GI complaint and you think they're like dehydrated, is to check a sugar. Babies, infants, notoriously will have low blood sugar. So a floppy baby, right, we, we think, okay, it's, you know, is it just from infection or is it from low sugar or is it from both? Um, because they don't have a lot of fat, they lose their glycogen stores, right? All the sugar in their body gets depleted, it goes away fast, and they really oftentimes will have sugars in the 30s and 40s. Very common, very <coughs> common. Um, treatment's a little bit trickier, um, you know, but, um, but if you just have to eat if they're, if they're still awake enough, or you can treat them. But for any bradycardia, you really have to, you should try to understand why they're in the bradycardic rhythm and then treat the underlying disease. Okay, so back to that kid, uh, the floppy kid that you bring in, can't really get good blood pressure, can't get a heart rate. Here's a chest x-ray, and you can see kind of in the right upper area, this white patch. Okay, so that's pneumonia. It's like a circular pneumonia. I'm taking up the right upper lung. Upper lung. And you take it. Like when I first kind of, you know, was, was studying different things, uh, I, I didn't really understand why, you know, low oxygen even caused the low heart rate. Um, I couldn't understand it. But really what happens is, in your heart, you know, you have the SA node at the top. That's where the, uh, the pulse comes that gives you the, your heartbeat. That's the electrical system. Um, when you're low oxygen, not as much oxygen, get into that area of the SA node, and then it's not beating, it's not sending a signal, and then you get the brain cardiac. That's kind of the problem. So what do we do? We give atropine typically. Okay, we know the dosage, 0.02 mg per kg. You have to give a minimum of 0.1. This is like a common thing that we that I quiz my residents on. Um, you know, at least give 0.1, um, and then you can you know, go up. For bradycardia, that's kind of like symptomatic, but they're awake, you know, you go up. Again, a lot of this is dose dependent or age dependent. You know, definitely use the Brazil to kind of help you guide you as far as uh, um, you know how much meds to give. Okay. Case number four. So you get called at 4.30 in the morning. Now, I always tell my residents that when any kid comes in in the middle of the night or early morning like that, they have to be sick. That absolutely has to be the case. And some of you are laughing out there because you know that that's not always the case. So my greatest story of all times was the 4.30 call and um, they came in. It was a six-year-old with right ear pain. I swear to God, right ear pain. And I was like, oh my God that ear better be falling off before I, you know, because I'm sitting here like, and I'm tired. And uh, it was clearly an ear infection. And I was like, wow. I was like, I was talking to the paramedic, I was like, you guys should just build an extra for making you guys come at 4 a.m. for this type of thing. But hey, that's what we do, right? That's what we all do. We save lives and ear infections at 4 a.m. <laughs> anyway, usually the kids are sick at 4.30. So, 4.30, call to the department, three-year-old um, who was in moderate distress, flush, and had pain in the right leg. Um, mother reports that he woke up with a fever, he couldn't walk earlier that morning, and um, took him to the doctor like he was, she was supposed to, and they said, oh, okay, I don't see much, give him some Motrin, time off for the fever, or maybe it's just some aches and pains, um, just call me if it gets worse. So the kid laid around all day, the mom said, and um, lay on the couch, just went, put him in bed, and you know, whatever. And then just kind of found him, and he was like screaming in pain, he had high fever, and so she called the ambulance. And here's the virus. Temperature, 104.5, heart rate was 150s, respirators of 40s, and blood pressure, 75 over 45. Um, dusky lips, dust, dry mucous membranes, heart rate tachycardic, weak pulses, in fact, couldn't really feel a pulse in the right foot, okay, so that's not very good. <laughs> Ronchi are those crackles in the right side of the chest, abdomen. Um, then you know, like the right thigh is kind of swollen and tender, kind of weird. Um, and then you kind of see some petechiae, some little purpura, like purpura, you know, like there's a group of blood vessels, kind of like the capillaries that like, um, 
and then petechiae are just like those pinpoint capillaries. When you push on those, then they don't turn white. That's petechiae. So if a red little dot doesn't turn white, that's petechiae. Um, that's worse. Those are capillaries that burst. Um, anyway, all four extremities are modeled. So clearly, you know, the kid's in shock, right? I mean, this kid's in shock. Unable to get an IV um, uh, pre hospital. So in a year, got the IV. White Cam got 23,000, gave two boluses of uh, 20 per kilo, and, um, and then he started antibiotics, Vancouver, and, and, and Rosef. And so um, didn't really know what was going on. We didn't know what was going on. We knew that the kid had an elevated white blood cell count. Um, so 23,000, most of you guys know. Usually for an adult, about 12,000 is normal. In a kid, depends on the age, can go up to 17,000. Um, that's like young, young kid. In a three-year-old, 23,000 is like double what it should be. So um, clearly not good. The kid looked bad. The right leg was all swollen. Didn't look good. You know, something was going on. Uh, we just really weren't sure. So when you're not sure, you just give like all kinds of medicines, right? That's what we did. Just give everything you can. So vancomycin and receptin are like really high, strong antibiotics um, to try to treat this. And then, so 4.30 came in. We did all our stuff. Went up to the ICU at 7. Still not sure what was going on. I knew the kid was sick. Um, so continued workup. Three hours later, continued to de decompensate. Was given fluids. They couldn't keep the blood pressure up. They had to start some dopamine, which is, you know, is a, is a pressure a presser to keep the blood pressure up. Um, and it was intubated. Um, and eventually, they went to an MRI, right? Because they're like, what could be going on with this leg? And this is a picture of the MRI. So all of this black stuff is air, is gas, okay? So that's not normal. And it should be like gray, not these black, all these black dots. Gas in muscle is infection. It's necrotizing fasciitis, okay? It's um, you know, bacteria that goes and just destroys everything that's in its way and it forms these gas pockets. And, uh, Oh, and it's, it's, it's like a mess. And you can see that this poor kid went to the OR, and they started trying to salvage his leg, and um, um, eventually just needed kind of amputation. Um, they were able to do a, um, a, they didn't have to, like, kind of, sometimes I've seen where they disarticulate, you know, kind of the whole leg, but um, they were trying to do, like, a, a below the knee because it's better for prosthetics. Um, but unfortunately, the infection had spread up enough um, or too much that then they kind of went you know, to an AKA. But um, the kid is alive, um, you know, thankfully, and, um, but it just shows kind of how fast something like this can happen. Um, I was seen by the doctor earlier that day with just kind of minimal symptoms. So, um, yeah. The, the thing I want to kind of talk about, though, is the shock management because um, you know, I think it was unrecognized perhaps in the doctor's office, I don't know. Um, and then, of course, pre hospital, we couldn't get an IV, but that's okay. You got to get you know, somewhere to get something. Um, so, what can we do? And let's just talk a little bit about shock. Because in kids, we underestimate it, we don't see it enough. Um, let me take that back. We see it, it's compensated, meaning their blood pressure is able to control it, or they're able to control it, their body can control it, and they usually do okay. What happens in kids frequently is they'll do okay, and then they'll die. Okay, so we don't want that to happen. Um, so let's talk a little bit about shock. That was a definition. Hopefully you read that. Um, different things that come in that will present with shock. If there's trauma, so they're bleeding, they go in hypovolemic shock. Um, vomiting, diarrhea, they're dehydrated, they're in hypovolemic shock, low blood pressure shock. And then, of course, infection control, or fever, um, <coughs> septic shock. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit about each one of those briefly. So a couple different types of shock. Okay. <coughs> Hypovolemic, low blood pressure from you know, losing fluids, like I mentioned. Uh, distributed shock is if they're in septic shock or anaphylactic shock, so their blood pressure is um, you know, really low, um, and all their, you know, uh, the fluids being on the outside, meaning they, they're still pink, um, and uh, so they're not blue and, and mottled, they're more pink, and, uh, but eventually then they'll go the other way. Um, cardiogenic shock, so if they're, if they're heart disease kids, which again isn't that common. And then, of course, obstructive, so if they have tamponade or tension pneumothorax. So a brief kind of overview of shock, just to kind of understand some of the pathophysiology. I'll do it really quick, but it's really important to understand kind of, you know, the, the body's physiologic response to this so that you can understand what you're treating and seeing. So 
I already said before, vitals are important. You have to know the heart rate of the individual kid so that you know a heart rate of 160 and a one, you know, six month old is okay, but not in a 12 year old like the kid we missed with the bacteria. Um, heart rate's too fast or too slow. We talked about this stuff. So. If it's not there, that's bad. Cardiac output. Your your heart will squeeze, so the number of volume, the, the strength of your heart will put out the uh, the blood flow throughout your body. Okay, so that's dependent on your heart rate. So the the body's first response is, and especially in kids, is your heart will be faster to keep the blood pressure up, right? So that makes sense. Heart goes faster, blood pressure comes up. And that's why frequently they'll have a normal blood pressure but a fast heart rate. But, and, and then indifferent than adults is that kids have more circulating blood volume, okay? So they have more blood volume um, larger than adults. So about 8% of their body weight is blood volume versus adult. But they can't constrict, their, the body has a ten tendency to strict down, uh, constrict down your own blood vessels to keep your pressure up. In kids, that can't happen as, as easy. Um, so that's why their heart rate is so dependent. Uh, in adults, you know, their pressure, you know, the, the blood pressure will go up because they they can constrict down and, and keep the uh, the contractility of the uh, heart going. The problem in adults, even though there's more blood volume in kids, um, it's smaller volume, right? Because they're, they're kids, right? They don't have, you know, they only have a few liters of, of volume, um, even though the percentage is higher. So what that means is, if an adult loses about 100 cc's of blood volume, that's about two percent of their whole body weight, okay? But if a kid loses about 100 cc's, that can be almost 20% of their blood volume. All right, so you're like, oh, okay, kid lost 100 cc's, adult lost 100 cc's, obviously we want to go to the kid. It just makes sense, right? So um, just understand that um, they're not equal as far as that. And I think most of us get that, um, but when you look at, wow, they didn't lose that much blood, but that really does a disaster to them. So what are some of the keys to kids that are early shot? Because these are the kids that we all see that some oftentimes do well, but that we have to really pick up on. So number one is if they're altered, right? If they're not acting right. I talked about it before. They're not consolable, they're irritable, they don't interact, um, and they don't respond to pain. You put an IV in and they don't move, obviously that's bad. Agro perfusion, cap refill, decreased urine output, you may or may not know that, but you can ask, you know, if, if they wear diapers, it's easier, like, yeah, when's the last diaper count? Like, when's the last time they had a late diaper? Um, and then, of course, the blood pulses. Cap refill should be checked on everybody. And most of you guys know what I'm talking about, but for, for um, just for a reminder for everybody, the um, uh, you push on your skin somewhere, and you really you push it till it's white, till it blanches, till it's white, and you let go, and then you cap until it becomes pink. And normal, just like an adult, should be less than two seconds. Should turn pink in two seconds. If you push it and it doesn't turn pink in two seconds, then that's bad. If it's three, four, five seconds, five, six seconds, that's really bad. Um, and the best place I think to check for it, I usually tell um, you know uh, my residents abdomen or thigh, you know for kids, for instance. And then blood pressures. We don't get a lot of blood pressures under three um, pre-hospital. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. It depends on you know everybody, but. Um, Traditionally, the teaching was under three, you don't really have to get a blood pressure. Even when I started at Leah Valley like 12 years ago, we really weren't getting blood pressures on, under three. Now we get blood pressure on everybody, and that's really important. But you have to know what's like the minimum, right? And if it, you go down to 60, but in general, systolic blood pressure should be at least 70 plus two times the age. Okay, so you can calculate your head. For a one-year-old, that means 72 is the minimum acceptable systolic blood pressure. For a five-year-old, five times two is 10, so 80 should be your minimum systolic blood pressure. Um, so it, I strongly recommend trying to get a blood pressure on all kids. You gotta have the right cuff, I get it, it's hard. Under three, it's hard because they're moving around the toddlers we talked about, so. Um, but if you can, try to do it because that'll be an early sign, um, or kind of a moderate sign, I guess. But again, kids can fool you. They can fool you, they can be in shock, have low blood pressure. And of course, as they get sicker, their cap refill goes up, their pulses go down, they become cool and modeling, and that's all in the effort, so they shut down the legs, the arms, the skin, and all the blood stays to the heart and the brain, because those are the two things that you need to live. But a kid in late shock, sorry about the, uh, sorry, but the kid in late shock is really about ready to, um, to arrest on you. And if you haven't already initiated the fluids, right, we always do 20 per kilo, basically, of, uh, of, of normal saline to get to start treatment or whatever, I would say, you know, get them fluid. I don't care how much fluid you give them because, you know, it's really hard to put a kid in heart failure. 
um, but try to get them for um, as quick as you can before they arrest. Because you have to know, shock is the most reversible cause of death in children. Like, we can save these kids' lives. They, no kid should die of shock if we can get to them in time. The problem is either we don't get to them in time because none of us know, um, you know they, we're not called early enough, or you know we just can't get good access, and, we're, and we just kind of sit on our hands <coughs> aggressively. Okay? Every hour that you know you can't, every hour goes up, um, reward it. For every hour, with a proper resuscitation um, of capillary for less than two, um, we increase mortality by 40%. Okay? So um, you have to jump on these kids and get the, uh, their blood pressure up. So I get it. It's not just all about fluids, but it's mostly about fluids for all of us. Okay? In the ER, pre hospital, anytime, fluids, fluids, fluids. Then once they get admitted, or you know, it depends on the situation, like if they're anaphylactic shot, all of us are going to get epi or, or albuterol, all these kind of things. Um, ingestions, this kind of thing, but um, absolutely, um, we have to kind of, uh, you know, be able to do this. Dysrhythmias, you know, we see patients coming up, I'll talk about a few coming up here, um, and then of course, we have some So, and this is a study that was done on transport of patients um, of 91 children, you know, these were sick patients, obviously, half of them died within 48 hours, um, and uh, for those that you know, do transport um, between facilities, um, a lot of times, they come in and the kids are still in shock. And so, um, whether if you're going to a place that's already started treatment or if they're you know, in the field, um, you know, they need fluid. I think that's the bottom line. Vascular access in kids can be very challenging. Um, I'm fortunate to work in a children's ER that the nurses are really good at sticks. Um, and a lot of you are really good at sticks. Like, you can get blood out of stone. I'm like constantly impressed. But, um, but uh, my recommendation, or at least what people say, anesthesiologists in particular for this one study, um, the, best of the, the best place to get an IV in kids is the back of the hand. Um, and you can see how much you have to bend back the wrist to really, oh, sorry, to really get um, you know, the ability to stabilize the vein. Um, you really kind of you know, bend back or flex the wrist um, you know, really far um, to the point where it almost hurts. It's the same when we do like a spinal tap, like we bend those kids like almost like an accordion. I mean, they can tell it, that's fine. So, um, doesn't hurt. They're crying anyway. Doesn't hurt. I'm sure. So, this is just an example of, um, you know, kind of like one way to do it. And, um, you know, show angle. I'm never upset if you can't get an IV pre hospital. Um, I mean, if the kid's really sick, then we'll talk about the next step. But, um, but um, because I know how hard it is. And, uh, and I worked and I worked at a children's hospital in Philly. I mean, you know, the classic teaching is at 90 seconds or three attempts and you're good to I.O., right? That's like what I tell everybody. Um, but nobody wants to do an I.O. if you don't have to because it hurts or something. I don't know. Um, I would say ignore all that and let's get back to the I.O.s, okay? Because if you have a kid in shock and you can't get an I.V., all right? And, you know, like I just said, if they're in late stage shock, they're about ready to die. So um, do an I.O., I guess is the bottom line. Um, and, uh, and I'll never fall you for trying. Now, um, a couple of like pearls with, has anybody here put an eye on, like an alive patient? Alive, yeah. A couple of people, good. Um, and um, it's, uh, yeah, we don't have to do it that often, but, um, but the bottom, and, and a lot of people don't know how to do it right. I mean, it's just because we don't, even though we get trained on how to do it, we get the egg and you know, like drill, drill an egg and stuff. Um, it's, it's, it's just a couple of different pearls I'll teach you real quick so that it always goes right because most of us will only have to do it once or twice in our career. Um, one is you have to know the size of the needle. Um, and uh, for PD, we use either the pink or the blue, typically. Um, and then the next thing you have to know kind of how depth. So this is, this is the, the first common kind of mistake that I see. The needle goes in. What you want to do first is you, you put your needle on and you put it to where you're going to go. Okay, so we know typically in kids, we either go on the, um, the proximal tin the distal tib or the, uh, the distal femur. Okay, those are the three sites, typically. Okay. Um, for adults, we also use the humors. But um, first, before you start the drill up, and I'm talking about easy I.O., and I apologize, I'm not like having money or, or financial thing with this, but um, I think most of us have easy I.O.s now. Um, if you don't, then they're not that expensive. I recommend you know, buying one. But um, first, take the needle and, and put it all the way to the bone before you drill. Put it in, go all the way to the bone. Feel the bone. You should feel it. 
Don't start at the skin like a drill, you know, like, you know, through the skin, because the, the tissues get all. I see that frequently, and it messes you up because what happens is you start drilling, and then you get hung up with the muscle and or the skin or whatever, and then it, it shoots you off course. So that's one problem. The second problem is you don't pick the right needle size. So you go in, you always go, you want to see that little mark, the five millimeter mark, that should be visible outside of the skin, okay? If it's not, then you're never going to hit the bone marrow. You're never going to hit the bone. So you always just insert this, the needle right into um, the bone, and you should feel the bone. Okay. Then you start your drill, and you do it nice and calm, and you go until it stops, and um, you know you know you're in. Now, once you're in, you, you take off the stylet and you pull back the bone marrow. The next problem that people don't do, and this is why they don't work, is that they don't give a flush. Okay, they don't give a flush. You should give two to five cc's of a flush in kids, and I'm talking about like a rapid push. Because what you're doing is you're creating a pocket in the bone marrow, so then the fluid will kind of run through it. Okay, so what happens, you know, you do it, you get the blood through it, everyone's like all excited, you start the fluid, and then it's not dripping. And then you're squeezing on that bag, you know, and you're like, what the heck's going on? So, um, so once you get in, always get that pocket of flush. And by the way, throughout, like say if you're transporting, eventually, maybe 20, 30 minutes into an IO, sometimes it can, that pocket needs to be recreated, so you have to give another flush. So if you're having any trouble, but you're pretty sure that you're in the right space, give a little bit of flush, five cc's, um, up to 10 cc's in an adult, um, or five cc's in a kid, and, uh, and that should help. So those are the two pearls. And you can see in kids, we were at the site, I, I went over the site briefly, everyone gets all hung up on the bone, uh, on the uh, on the growth plates. Um, so you just gotta know where you're going, okay? Um, and, um, and you should be able to feel, you know, the tibial tuberosity is that bone, bony area kind of below the kneecap. And you can go at least a centimeter down, a centimeter medial, and by centimeter I mean one fingertip, you know, typically. And, um, and you know, you'll stay away from the growth plate. Right, the growth plate's way up here. But you're saving lives, right? So, you know, if you have to do an IO, do an IO, you know, and I'll back you up. All right. Should I keep going or take a break? Or? Keep going. Keep going? Okay. All right. Called to an amusement park. Eight year old started complaining of chest pain. Just got off the roller coaster and was crying with chest pain and mom's crying. And oh, by the way, uh, unfortunately, his father had just died two weeks ago from a heart attack and chest pain. Oh. So I find amusing, I mean, chest pain in general, okay, so 95% of pediatric chest pain is non cardiac, right? You can imagine. And our job is just to reassure everybody that it's going to be okay, all right? You're not having a heart attack, because they're always worried about that. Um, when I was kind of, you know, preparing for the lecture, I came across this algorithm on how to manage chest pain. This is for pediatricians on how to manage chest pain. I should go talk to the pediatrician about it, because, anyway, um, you get down to like a 10-year-old female, and it says, always consider psychogenic chest pain. I'm just saying, I don't know. So... That's what the pediatricians are taught. But anyway, this is not what you want to see, but this can cause chest pain. What do you guys see? Black on one side, no lung, lung on this side. That's a tension pneumo. Um, yeah, you don't want to get a chest x-ray of tension pneumo. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, you want to be compressed first, but it uh, looks like, um, but uh, anyway. So when do we get pediatric EKGs? Um, we get them for chest pain just so we can show the parents that everything's okay. All right, that's one reason. And by the way, when you see a pediatric EKG, a lot of people get nervous because it doesn't look normal like an adult, and this is a difference between adult and kids. In kids, when they're born, we have what's called a juvenile T wave inversion. So V1 through V6, now this doesn't. This is an older kid, V1 through V6 are typically the T waves are inverted. We, we all know from adult EKGs that's not normal, right? You should see upright T waves. Maybe not in V1, but in general, V2 through V6, the T waves are upright. So when they're down, don't think that that's abnormal. Um, so when a kid's born at age one, they start flipping upright. So the T waves are down, up through V6, and then as they get older, V6 flips up, V5 flips up, V4, until you get to kind of a normal adult EKG. Typically around age eight, you go to about age 12, but um, uh, so anyway, T wave inversions uh, are not uncommon. For pediatrics, though, we get an EKG for chest pain, I mentioned. And then I recommend giving it for syncope, like passing out, or for um, palpitations. So if it's, you have an elevated heart rate. So those are your indications for EKG. And for heart rate, you might see something like um, this case, 14-year-old, 
Um, finished her second hand of energy drink. She was feeling lightheaded. Um, it's awesome. Flush and uh, feels like she might pass out. And then you get this. What do you guys think? You hope it would look like this. So it's kind of a regular, narrow, complex, right? Like a SVT type thing. Because those are easy to treat, right? I, really love, I love treating SVT. I think everybody here probably likes it. Um, as long as the kids are stable, of course, you know. We had like this uh, two-month-old that kept coming in like every week with SVT. Like the mom's like, he's an SVT again, you know? And you're like looking at this little kid. He's like, you know, four pounds or something because he's like premature. And uh, we're like trying to find an IV. So we use all of his scalp veins. I think we use that one because he came in like uh, uh, which, by the way, after we can talk about getting scalp IVs, because everybody should know how to do that. But if you're allowed to, I don't know. The rules. Um, but anyway, so we kind of know, you know, treatment. Um, by the way, a couple years ago, I uh, I took care of um, of a dwarf, okay, um, and a little person. Like I'm a little person, too, I guess, but a little person. And uh, and and like I was like, I wonder how much adenosine to get like. Like, because they're kind of, and I was like, I guess regular amount, but anyway, so I gave a child to dose. It works, so I don't know. You know, I have no idea what that was for. Random. Okay. Uh, anyway, this is the EKG for that girl, 14 year old. Wow. I know that's like, oh my God, I don't want this call. Go back. So this is wide complex. So wide complex or scary, okay, but it's not regular, and the kid's talking to you, so you don't think it's B-fib or anything, um, and you're not sure if it's B-tac, but it's not regular. So this was WPW, Wolf, Parkinson, White. So Wolf, Parkinson, White is where, I might have a picture of it. Well, that's what EKG looks like. Wolf, Parkinson, White, typically what happens with electrical activity is, the SA node I mentioned before, the electric comes down here, goes through this area, and then comes up, and then the heart will contract up here when it's here, and then as it comes up with this blue, it contracts, okay? So electrical activity comes down, heart contracts first, and then heart contracts second. Will Parkinson White, this area is open. Usually, this is like a barrier, like no electric, electricity can get through it. But here, there's like a little opening, so the electrical charges come down. So what happens is, you get this, the heartbeat will kind of contract a little bit faster, because here it's a little bit slower to get down. And so you get this little widened area on the EKG. So the QRS complexes are wider, because the, the, the ventricle, the bottom part of the heart, is the electrical charges are getting through it faster, because of that opening. What will happen is, sometimes, is the heart rate will speed up if that area is blocked, if the AV node is blocked for whatever reason, and then you'll just get this circle where the heart will just keep kind of going around, setting off another charge, and then you'll just keep getting really fast heart rate. And sometimes it's induced by us, right? So you get um, a kid who's in a fast heart rate like an SVT, um, and you give for a though, which we don't hardly give anymore, and then the heart rate gets to 300, and you're like, oh my god, what did I just do? Um, because the verapamil will block this little area. Um, so. What am I trying to, where am I trying to go with this? So, uh, don't give her out, I guess. But, um, but uh, the bottom line is, when you do see a wide complex um, that looks kind of irregular, um, we know adenosine probably won't work, um, although sometimes you can try it, but don't. And uh, if the pressure's okay, then you can you know, kind of just transport them. And then we use procainamide, um, or you can cardio them, and you should get it back. And then their EKG after that looked like this. And you can see that that's not normal because of this QRS widening, uh, if you will. All right, so something to Eight month old was picked up from daycare um, because the child had a fever. The mom took the temperature daycare, it was 103, so she took him out to the uh, car and was in the parking lot, placed the kid into a car seat, and then he started shaking and became unresponsive. Came on scene, the child was unresponsive, um, did respond to painful stimuli, um, a lot of secretions in the mouth, temperature is 103, during paramedic assessment, the child started seizing again. Now you're like, oh my God, we have a seizing kid. So, 
Seizures are scary to the parent for sure, um, and even, you know, I, I would guess, you know, in a pre-hospital, even in the ER, because, um, you know, you gotta stop the seizure. I mean, that's the bottom line, because um, we know that the longer the kid seizes, the worse their outcome. So I would say, no matter what you can do, is try your best to stop the seizure, it, you know, depending on the medication you can get and the root and all this stuff. Febrile seizures, typically, febrile seizures are a very common, you know, thing that we see, um, as you guys know, and um, typically they're simple. They're, they're, they're not life-threatening. They'll come in, simple, simple febrile seizures are those in six months to age six years that are less than 15 minutes in length. The kids wake up, um, they may have some postictal, maybe they may be sleepy afterward, um, and they only have one. Those ones, very common that I see coming in, um, and those ones do typically do fine. You find out what the source is, they typically don't have meningitis, it's a virus that caused it, you know, it just happened that the fever dropped their seizure threshold, uh, whatever. A complex one, like this case, where they had a second seizure, or they continued to seize, they woke up, um, uh, they didn't wake up in between the seizures. Um, these ones are a lot more serious, um, and we'll talk about what could cause that. And finally, about 5% of the times we pick up, like this kid did end up having, is status, um, status epilept epilepticus. So that's a seizure that lasts, you know, typically longer than 30 minutes, um, and, um, and that's bad. Because we know mortality and morbidity goes up um, somewhere between 20, 20 to 30 percent mortality. So your job, our job, everybody's job is to you know stop the seizure. Okay, and if that means if you have to give them so much benzos, you know, uh, diazepam or lorazepam or midazolam or whatever you can give, um, and then have to intubate, that's okay. I'd rather have to do that than let the kids seize. So we know that um, you know. For this case, everybody was protected, high oxygen. Um, actually, the kid did stop seizing the root a little bit. Um, but, it, you know, status is, is not really that common, 20 per 100,000. Um, and we know that oftentimes with kids, it's from fever um, or it's from withdrawal of their medicine. So the kids that have epilepsy and then they just stop taking it for whatever reason, these are common ones that we all see. And then, of course, overdose that can have this status. But like I said, you have to treat it, and you have to treat it fast. And you have to check your glucose. Number one, it could be low sugar can cause seizure. Okay, we know that. But the second thing is, again, as they're seizing continuously, um, they start eating up some of their sugar stores, and then they could have that problem on top of it. Um, and so you have to know kind of the, the routes that you're allowed to do. IM, IV, IO, rectal, buccal, you know, into the, whatever you can do to get that um, medicine into them, please do your best to, to, try, to get, try to get it in. Because again, 30% mortality if we don't stop it. That case, by the way, that I mentioned, um, you know, the kid, kid, I kind of talked about it briefly before, the kid came in, stopped seizing, but it wasn't protecting their way to be intubated, then it was the right brain stem intubation, the kid ended up uh, actually dying a few days later um, in the PICU. Um, I, it's not really from the intubation, I think it just had some anoxia because by the time they came in, it was like pretty hypoxic. Um, despite appropriate you know, transport care, pre hospital care, um, was given oxygen and everything appropriate, just couldn't maintain. I think probably aspirated quite a bit and then went into a, uh, uh, we call R, you know, acute respiratory distress syndrome. ARDS, like just total cascade of the inflammation in the lungs and they just couldn't, couldn't survive. All right, case number eight, call for a uh, child for, from a head injury. So this 20 month old um, fell off the top bunk of a hardwood floor, awake and alert, no bleeding. And then there's a kind of a swelling lump on the back of the head um, and uh, placed on the spinal board, C-spine, and then the patient started vomiting. So got in pretty quickly, was awake, and here's what the CAT scan looked like. That's not normal. Um, all of this white stuff, that's blood, okay? So this poor kid had um, a subdural. That's a subdural hematoma. And in kids and adults, you know, epidurals are those ones that they have the bleed from usually from an artery, and then they look okay for that one hour, and then they, you know, then they just go unresponsive and die. Subdurals typically are still kind of awake. They're vomiting. They don't feel well. They don't want to move their head too much because it hurts. Um, these are the subdurals. Those are usually from ve the veins that bleed. Um, and traumatic wise, the epidural we see more in adults and kids we see more subdurals um, just from the fall. This kind of thing. The treatment's pretty much the same. You've got to get the blood to stop, you know, and down. But tra trauma is a leading cause of death in, in, in older kid, or kids older than uh, a year. 
Um, and, uh, and it's usually new trauma, you know that. Um, just look at this, on this, um, I think it was uh, up to age 19, um, so basically all kids, 6,000 deaths, 60,000 hospitalizations, and 600,000 ER visits. Everybody here is taking care of a head injury kid, there's no doubt about it, whether it's a football injury, you know, whether it's a fall of the bunk, you know, whatever. Um, it's very common. So, what are cases that when you know you come and look at kid, when you look at their appearance, that you think that they're going to have something serious, they're going to have bleeding in their brain? Well, you check for their mental status. So, kids with GCS less than 14, okay, that's probably the number one. Their altered mental status is probably the number one thing that they're going to have a bleed in their brain. Um, signs of basilar skull fracture. That's what these two things, pictures, represent. The basilar skull is kind of the inside. You get a fracture inside the skull, and then they have bleeding. The two areas that they bleed are around the eyes, the raccoon's eyes, kind of looks like a raccoon, and then behind the ears, it's called a battle sign. Okay, I guess from swinging them. And um, so those two areas check for, and that should increase your concern that there's a traumatic brain injury of the bleed. And then, of course, like I said, ultramental status. So if they're slow to respond, repetitive, somnolent, or agitated, um, that's a lot of concussion, I get it, okay, but it's all, it's, it, it can also be this. Things that may make you more concerned, if they lost consciousness, so more than five seconds, okay, so almost all kids, like, I think I lost consciousness, they don't have no clue, I think I lost consciousness, you know, but, um, you know, more than five seconds, for sure, above two minutes increases your risk, but five seconds is my cutoff, because everybody, like, loses consciousness for a second, basically, so, um, History of vomiting, and that's usually two episodes or more of vomiting, that increases your risk. And then, of course, severe headache, which makes sense. And then mechanism. So we know a fall from five feet, five feet um, is, uh, is worse than, you know, at least five feet or above, that's kind of worse. Actually, falls down steps, typically, um, the kids do fine. They don't have problems because they're like mini falls. Um, they have a little musculoskeletal stuff, but their heads are almost always okay. Um, but anyway, so it's the falls greater than five feet, um, the, the severe the acceleration, deceleration injuries, those things increase your risk for head injury. And that one picture I showed a long time ago that never made it to the slide, up until age eight, the uh, head is proportionally large, okay? Um, and, uh, and then your body kind of catches up. So, um, and in fact, in newborns, about 25% of the weight is all up in the head. We know that, it makes sense, their head, they can't keep it up in a bottle head. Um, and uh, their occipital regions are high and they're, are larger and their, their faces are smaller. Um, so a lot of the trauma, um, just expect, if you see a trauma in a kid, just expect that their head's involved, uh, especially up until age eight. And what happens when you um, put them on the you know, spinal board, you know, again, they, they um, uh, because of just the way their head is, um, you know, they'll just keep it, you know, flexed basically, and then so you have to just bring it forward uh, underneath the torso with some blankets, or if you have like kind of that shallow carve out. Some people get nervous about, but I do recommend looking at their fontanelles or feeling their fontanelles, you know. Um, parents or moms always get nervous, like, you know, when I'm, like, touching the kid's head. But, um, you know, you can check. And this is, you know, because they have an open fontanel. The top of their brain is open because the skull has infused, and you'll see swelling there, you know. And that can go up to 18 months. Usually by a year it's closed, um, but it's a good thing to check it under one year because if you see swelling like this, then you know something's wrong. A couple, uh, you, uh, I think it was a couple months ago, we had uh, the case, some of you guys might have taken care of, the, uh, the mom was in the van, the minivan, yeah, the minivans are also, I try to get my wife to buy a minivan, she like thinks I'm crazy, but I'm trying to get it by one. Um, but um, anyway, she, um, she uh, the, and then I told her the story, so no one wants a minivan after this. So she, um, she had a couple kids, they all got out, and then she had the newborn, she's trying to get the kid out. I guess one of the kids hit the button for the automatic shut, and so as she's trying to get the kid out, I guess she's like talking to the other kid or whatever, and then the door shuts on his head. Oh. Now, it's supposed to have, I thought it had some kind of release, like it which should open back up, but I, wherever the head, the little head was, it, it didn't. So she's pulling it out. Now, people are walking by like it's a school parking lot, and they're like thinking she's trying to get a book bag out of the car. She finally gets it out, and it was literally a deformed skull. I mean, and, I mean, there was definitely some, I mean, it had, you know, skull fractures and, and it, Thank God the kid did okay, actually, um, but which is like unbelievable. But um, but I mean, it was like an indentation of the car door. I mean, it's like unbelievable. But check the fontanelles. If it's bulging, always assume there's increased pressure. 
Okay? Just assume it is. Doesn't mean there is, but assume it is. If it's a fever, it could be meningitis. If it's trauma, head bleed. Assume there's pressure in the brain. Intracranial pressure, ICP. If it's sunken, dehydration. So these are the things I, I test for for dehydration besides cap refill. Um, just check your fine out. If it's flat or, or if it's sunken, then it could be the dehydration. Look at this case. This is probably one of the saddest cases um, that I've recently kind of been involved with. Um, so the story here was, I think this kid was two. Like a small two. And um, mom brought her in because uh, she noticed the swelling. And she said that the night before, she was kind of playing with the older kids. I think the older kid was like 10, with older brothers and sisters. And, they were roughhousing, and maybe she fell out of bed, and they just kind of put her back in bed. Now, we all know that's not normal. Um, you can kind of see a couple different shots. And so the story of falling out of bed and putting her back in, I mean, like, this happens all the time. I mean, we all take care of kids like this, and they don't look like this. And then you're like, you look kind of closer. Let me see if, and you're like, what's underneath here, you know? That's like a kind of like an older bruise. Okay. Check out the baby some more. Had some pain in the elbow. You know, what the heck could be going on? And this is the CAT scan. Now, this is like unbelievable. I like I've never seen anything like this before. So this is the skull, and this is the scalp. Okay? Skull, scalp. Now, this is blood. It's called, um, it's underneath the uh, galea, subgalea bleed. This is a bleeding, this is all blood, basically, on top of the, on top of the skull, but underneath the skin, basically. And it's, this is all abuse, okay, if you haven't picked up on it already. Um, so, I'll talk about abuse in a second. But, I don't know if they were dragging the kid by the hair, and somehow that caused the skin to come up off the skull, or if, Somehow they shook the kid and it, it, it unroofed the galea, the, the, the lining that kind of sits on the, the skull. And, and, uh, I'm just not sure. Um, but regardless, it's, you can't get this from hardly much trauma uh, other than abuse. And you can see it's like four centimeters. I mean, it's like, you know, it's like this much. And in the elbow, you see this white markings here. That's like healing bone. It's called periosteal elevation. That's healing bone. That's from a fracture, a supracondylar fracture. And kids can get this, okay, fall on off stretch hand. But, you know, it was never treated. Like, the kids cried and probably have cried for like two or three weeks with this um, as it was healing. They do, they heal probably two weeks. But, I mean, there's no doubt the kid probably wasn't using an arm for like two weeks. So, that's kind of abuse and neglect. Like, if you want to assume that, you know, you know okay, you don't let this kid, someone didn't bring it. So you always have to consider abusing kids for trauma. Always. <laughs> consider it, you know. Doesn't mean that it's there, but always consider it. And this is an eye-opening to, to me, who kind of got trained in the adult pediatric world, that, um, that, this, that you have to kind of suspect it all the time. Because you'll miss it, and then the kid will go home and then die, because the perpetrator's typically a known person. Um, so you always have to do it. And, I encourage all of you to question it and then let me know or let somebody know or fill out a CY47, whatever it takes, because I'd rather like report abuse and then be wrong. We all would, right? And then um, and have the parents be annoyed or whatever, uh, or have to go through what they have to go through to kind of prove it, just to make sure the kid's okay. And I've admitted kids just to get them out of the house, if I don't know, um, you know just to get them away, because I think that's a safer thing. So always ask, is this fit with the story? I mean, that's the bottom line. Does this fit with the story? And you'll, you'll be surprised at how good the parents are covering up. It's typically, okay, a step parent, it's typically, but it's typically something they do. Okay, so always suspect abuse. Four-year-old with lethargy and vomiting comes in, um, was kind of drowsy, but responsive. And mom was concerned, I couldn't really wake him up, so here's the blood pressure. Okay, again, pretty low, right? Heart rate's low, 124. Again, this kid was four, so I don't know, maybe that's okay. We use GCS um, to help us kind of guide, you know, guide, you know for patients that are altered. 
Um, and that's important for you to know how to do a GCS score, right? Because you know, it gives me, if you're calling the command, um, and then just to kind of understand, is the kid kind of altered or not. In kids, there is a modified Glasgow Common Scale. There's absolutely a way for you to do it for a kid that's um, under one. Um, but to remember all of these things is, is hard, so I have it in my phone just to kind of you know, remind myself. Um, <laughs> And that's kind of bottom line. I think that you just need some kind of remembrance. But try to get a good you know, kind of assessment of their GCS, even if you know, they're two months old, for instance. So for that basic case, um, for an altered patient, a patient that's not really responding, but you don't really suspect infection because mom doesn't get a history of fever, um, you know, what could be going on? Always check the sugar. Um, you know, and then think like, you know, I guess, you know, Narcan, you know. But anyway, the mnemonic that I always remember, and I apologize because I don't know if you'll be able to see it all the way in the back, is this AIOU TIPS mnemonic. I have a lot of different mnemonics. This one, you know, it's hard because there's a lot on it, but uh, it is a healthy clue in, like, what could be causing this, this kid to be altered or, or just, you know, unresponsive? So could they have ingested something like alcohol? Could they be having a, had a seizure? We see that not uncommon first-time seizures in kids that they come in because the kids are sleepy for an hour or two afterward, and they don't see the seizure. Infection, did they, get, did they overdose on insulin? Did they overdose? Did they get into some opiates? Are they in renal failure? Not that common um, in kids. Uh, but this is also good for adults. Trauma, again, infection. If there's some psychosis, um, again, mostly more common in adults. And then, um, could they have a stroke? We see about seven um, strokes a year in Leah Valley for pediatric, um, real strokes. Um, and I'll come back maybe another time to talk about, or I know you heard some stroke talking about pediatric stroke. Um, different in adults than kids is that strokes about 40, about 50% of the time, it's hemorrhagic, 50%, it's ischemic, unlike adults, which is mostly you know, ischemic, that kind of thing. And then of course tumors. We do unfortunately pick up quite a few tumors in the ER for kids with new onset uh, tumors in the brain. Because they present oftentimes with seizure or mental status change. So this kid basically, we were kind of doing everything. Like we were like um, uh, we were going through the whole thing. Kid wasn't really waking up, so we we're like, "Oh, the blood work looks okay. The sugar is okay. You know, what could be causing it?" And then I'm going in. I'm talking to dad. Oh, like we have to do the spinal tap because I'm worried he's got infection or something's going on. Cat skin is normal in this kid. Um, and then the dad's like, "Well, do you think he could have drank my orange juice?" And I was like, "I don't think it would be orange juice that caused it." He goes, "Well." My orange juice, <laughs> I, I kind of mix my methadone with the orange juice, <laughs> like, like uh, yeah, it could be the orange juice, actually, so, so, methadone, so, um, and I guess this is common with methadone, they, uh, the liquid methadone, they can simply drink it down, anyway, um, what a cocktail that would be, anyway, so, Methadone is a synthetic uh, opiate. It, it's like heroin or morphine, okay? And the problem is that, you know, in a kid, of course, you can die from it because it's, uh, it's very strong. Um, and uh, you, you give Narcan, the kids do well, and we've had this case before. We didn't really know what it was, uh, or that's not it. We knew it was methadone overdose, um, and the kid that kind of just adjusts a little bit. We gave Narcan, and then the kid looks great, right? Because that's what Narcan does, it helps. Um, but methadone lasts like 24 hours. Narcan only lasts like one or two hours. So watch a kid around. Um, and this is a different hospital. But you're like, oh my God, what are they doing? Uh, but anyway, um, you watch it for they're, they're running around fine, and then they, they get discharged, um, and then only to come back in a few hours because the kid's unresponsive again. So that kid did okay because we just gave like, Narcan. Unfortunately, this time just admitted the kid to get a Narcan drip, which we sometimes have to do. Um, but, um, but the bottom line is, don't assume that they're okay, just with the other one. They may have to give uh, higher doses. So briefly on overdose, this is very common in kids, okay? Because like, the kids love to explore, and oh wow, my mom takes that, I'm gonna try that. Um, very common things we see from cosmetics, cleaning products, and then Motrin Tylenol, this is all that's kind of around. Um, usually the toddler stage, right? A lot of times, it's because the medicine's around. Usually, you can blame the grandparents. And my mother-in-law, like I love my mother-in-law. I do. I love her. I love her. <laughs> I bought her a car, actually, because like, she babysits. Like, it was a used car, OK? Like, I mean, you're a doctor, a neurosurgeon, you know, what the heck. And uh, so, uh, you know, and, and, but this is why, because 
she like is a little flighty and she like parks it on this hill and she like left it in a drive and like got out and like it went down the hill and smashed in the thing. And she's just as flighty with pills. She like takes all of her pills in like her hand and just like throw like she doesn't like take them and like put them in her mouth. She like throw I think it's a she throws them into her mouth. And then the pills go flying, and my kids like love it. Like they think it's this game. Or anyway, I don't know where I'm going. The grandparents, blame the grandparents. So there's all these pills like in my house. We're actually getting new babysitter. My wife's here. Um. Anyway, the pills are there. They're always in the reach. So um, there are quite a few pills that if the kid just takes one, then they could die. Okay, methadone is one of them. It depends on the dosage, it depends on the age of the kid, but these pills or liquids, medicine, you just take one and then the kids can die. So if these are important. Methadone, oxycodone, fentanyl, clonidine, okay, visine, and we all learned that on the uh, wedding crashers. I don't know if you see it. Bradley Cooper, Anyway, visine, um, sulfonylurea, camphor, and ethyl salicylate, which went over oil ground. I think a lot of people use that as much as but this stuff, you know, be, be cautious if the kids get into this stuff. Okay, last case. Right. So I wanted to kind of finish with one of like the best saves um, that, that, that I've kind of been a little bit part of. I mean, everything was done for us, but so I don't know much. But um, this case came a 17 year old called to a um, high school because the kid was not active, right? He was unconscious, but breathing. Um, and then right before they get there, like the school personnel start doing CPR. So you come in, now they're doing CPR in a 17 year old. Um, but you didn't really know, so anyway, um, you come in, and all you get was the kid has like all these medicines for ADHD, um, and uh, didn't really feel well, but then passed down, and is now in cardiac arrest. So the guys, you know, appropriately did all kinds of maneuvers, did everything they're supposed to, found the GCS was eight. Um, which probably sounds like it should be three, but whatever, GCS was eight, blood pressure was okay, SATs were okay, and then didn't see any trauma, um, kind of got some additional history on the concern of Ritalin. Um, also noted the kid had a cold, was taking pseudoephedrine. Like, what the heck? You always ask family history with people passing out because frequently there's a heart defect that's congenital that gets passed along, like ProQT, but there's no history of that. So found him unresponsive, started bag bag mass, uh, IV, um, and you get this with him. Cool. They got this with him. So it says at the bottom that's that that's um, anyway, it's B fib. Set to uh, fibrillate, and bam, get a rhythm back. And then in like the story book ending, the kid woke up and went back to class. That's not <laughs> it's like Grey's Anatomy, I don't know if you guys watch that show. It did cardiac arrest on play, like two, two like episodes of like two hours of cardiac arrest, and then like, you know, she went back to work. Awesome. When I was an intern, I had like a GI bug, because like, and uh, so I had an IV, like, you know, uh, like during work, they like put an IV in me. But they didn't let me stop working, which I don't think that's right. You know? So, <laughs> same. No, it's rules now. The residents actually don't work that hard anymore. I'm that bad old. So, uh, so anyway, BFIB, BFIB shocked back, um, kind of still kind of out because it's that post arrest phase. We all know it where the, you know, the kids, adults kind of don't really wake up because their brain's like shocked and they don't have any oxygen and blood flow and things a little bit. Um, anyway, we intubated the kid and admitted to the ICU. It was actually pretty fascinating, um, this case, because it was just kind of. All of a sudden, this doesn't happen in often kids, right? We know in general, by the way, this last patient girl, um, in general, respiratory, uh, cardiac arrest in kids is almost always due to respiratory, okay? That's the thing. So you maintain the oxygen, and then they, you're due, fix that problem, they won't die, typically. This kid's a little bit different, died suddenly, and we see this sometimes, especially in teenagers, um, when this could happen. This was an echo, and it basically shows that the heart's not contracting 100%. Not, it's kind of a stiff heart, if you will. Um, and this is a cardiac MRI, and this basically shows, this is the ventricle, and this is the wall of the heart, and that's thick, that's abnormal. That's a really thick wall of the heart. Okay, so two things that can, you can have a congenital thing, um, idiopathic hypertrophic um, cardiomyopathy, like uh, their valve can kind of uh, have a hard, hard time to output. Those are the kids that are like running, like the bases or something, and they collapse. 
This was a little different. This kid was a Ritalin, I mentioned. Now, Ritalin, we know, will increase your blood pressure. And so the kid probably had blood pressure for a couple, high, high blood pressure for a couple of years, caused like basically hypertension, and we know that the heart becomes different. Plus, then started taking the pseudoephedrine and some of those cough medicines, and all that basically led to a um, going into some kind of arrhythmia and then collapsing. So they put an ICD in the kid um, because he did wake up. Actually, did fine. Actually, no problems with you know, limitation, totally um, you know, no noxia and brain damage, nothing like that. Um, put a nice AICD just in case that should happen again. Put you know, start treating his blood pressure, things like that. Took him off the meds, um, and the kids walking around doing well. It was a great save. It really was. So just briefly, finally, on what causes sudden death in teenagers? We talked about congenital heart. Okay, we all get that one. But a prolonged QT, some of you might be walking around with a, a, a long QT uh, interval in the uh, thing, and so you know sometimes you can just collapse with that if you're on different medicines or, or whatever. Um, cardiomyopathy. Sometimes I'll see kids that come in with fevers for a couple days, and then they basically go into heart failure, and um, like a week or two later, uh, what happens is their heart becomes dilated and just can't constrict, and they have no output because uh, the virus attacks the heart. They get a cardiomyopathy. Um, and then, of course, this kid was a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy from long-standing hypertension. Commotion cordis, those are like the, um, the catcher, right? The ball hits them right in the chest, and then they collapse. Um, nothing you prevent it except for have uh, defibrillators like everywhere you can, which is like, which is great. They're at the mall, they're on the fields, they're, they're you know, we all do. So, um, you know, to try to get them, you know, restarted right away. Um, and then, of course, you know, drugs can always do it. Okay. And that's basically it for my lecture. Know the pediatric assessment triangle. Know that children are not uh, little adults. Thank you for everything you guys do.